Okay, so today we're going to start another biochem chapter. We're going to do a chapter in carbohydrates, which I don't think I really need to work very hard to convince you guys of the importance and relevance of carbohydrates as a fuel source, uh, as an essential part of diet, whether for humans or for animals. So I probably already worked a little too hard, but that's fine. <laughs> you can have that for free. Uh, uh, I think you already know carbohydrates are sugars. They're pretty much one and the same thing. And uh, they're, they're called carbohydrates for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, in terms of their structure, which of course is always going to be what we're going to focus on here, uh, carbohydrates are polyhydroxyaldehydes or polyhydroxyketones. And I would put it to you, you know what all those big sounding words mean. Poly, many, hydroxy, OH aldehydes or polyhydroxy ketones. So there are ketones and aldehydes with a whole bunch of OH groups. That's all you need to know to understand carbohydrates. And we know something about OH groups. We did chapter seven, which was about alcohols, and we learned quite a bit about how they react. We also just finished chapter nine, which is on aldehydes and ketones and how they react. So the order that I'm putting the chapters in, I know I jump around a lot, but I'm, I'm trying for there to be some kind of method to my madness since we just finished the chapter on aldehydes and ketones, I think it's relatively timely. So in order to understand how carbohydrates behave, uh, with understanding how alcohols and aldehydes and ketones behave, you're, you're already most of the way there. Uh, I think since there's going to be a lot of words coming, out you, uh, coming at you, I think we'd better start with some definitions. Uh, I'll write down at least some of them, but these are all in the class notes, by the way. Uh, but in terms of the other reason that we call them carbohydrates, uh, that term comes not as much from their structure as from their molecular formula, because it turns out pretty much all common carbohydrates, all of the ones you'll have heard of and all of the ones that are like ones you'll have heard of, all have a formula that is as if they contained either an equal number or an almost equal number of carbon atoms and water molecules. Now, of course, carbohydrates aren't literal water molecules literally stuck onto carbon atoms. That would not be possible. Hydrogen can't form enough bonds and the carbon would be in trouble as well. But, um, but their molecular formulas are like as if they contained either equal or almost equal numbers of carbon atoms and water molecules. So for example, just to give some examples of some carbohydrate uh, formulas, glucose is C6H12O6. And we'll be learning the structure of glucose. It's one of the few structures I'm gonna ask you to actually memorize. I'm not hugely into memorization, but I think glucose is pretty important. It's one of the main ways that energy is carried uh, in the blood. So I think you'll all have heard of glucose. You can also find it in, in, uh, in fruits and vegetables, mostly fruits. But if you work it out, you see it has essentially like six carbon atoms and H12O6 is like six H2Os. So it's as though it contains six carbons and six H2Os. That's not actually the structure of glucose as you'll see shortly, but it's as if that's what it contained. Or another fan favorite, sucrose, happens to be C12H22O11. And I'm, I'm the, memorizing these formulas is not my concern here. I'm just trying to, to show you where we get this word carbohydrate from. And I think you'll see this one is 12 carbons and H22O11 is like 11 water molecules. So it's like 12 Cs and 11 H2Os. Again, that isn't literally the structure of sucrose, but that it's as if that's what it contained. So that's why we call them carbohydrates, carbon waters. That's where that word comes from. Uh, uh, carbohydrates themselves, at least uh, uh, the, the monosaccharides, as we call them, that is simple sugars that contain just one carbonyl group, uh, split into two categories. Well, there's, there's many ways of categorizing them, but one of them is categorizing them as aldoses and ketoses. And aldoses are going to be those sugars that contain an aldehyde functional group. So you do need to know your functional groups. Good review for the final exam as well. And ketoses are those uh, um, sugars that contain a ketone functional group. 
And we're not gonna see too many of them. I'll just let you know one very famous ketose that you've probably heard of is fructose. And I think you can even go buy fructose at the supermarket now. My understanding, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, but my understanding is that diabetics can take fructose and there's no problem. Or at least that's what I've heard, but don't quote me on that. Like I said, I'm not a medical doctor, nor do I play one on TV. Um, uh, but certainly those who have trouble uh, hydrolyzing the, the, uh, the uh, um, the glycosidic bond in sucrose. Sucrose contains, uh, maybe it's not diabetics I'm thinking of, but sucrose contains a glucose bonded to a fructose. And I know there's at least one uh, metabolic disease where you have trouble breaking that bond between the glucose and the fructose. And certainly those people can take fructose because they don't have to worry about uh, hydrolyzing that glycosidic bond. And we'll get to those glycosidic bonds, I would say Friday or Monday. Uh, we'll eventually get to those. Um, let's see what else. We already talked about aldoses and ketoses. Uh, other terms you're going to hear are going to be the counting terms. So we talk about trioses, which have three carbons, tetroses, which have four carbons, pentoses of five, hexoses of six. And you could keep going if you really wanted, heptose, octose, those things exist too. Um, but that just tells you how many carbons are in the simple sugar molecule. So that, that OS ending, if you ever see that OSE, probably it's talking about sugars. Uh, that certainly would be the most reasonable guess, I would say. Um, and in terms of uh, uh, the, the getting more specific about the structures of uh, simple sugars, uh, I would like to start simple. Let's start with the simplest possible molecules that can at all be said to have the properties of a sugar. And it turns out you need at least three carbons for that. You can't get anything particularly sugar-like with only one carbon or two carbons. You need at least three. And so uh, the, th the two important trioses are glyceraldehyde and dihydroxyacetone. So um, let's see. We, uh, in the past, have drawn uh, compounds with a chiral carbon like this. You know what, I'm gonna to try to do the thing again. Let me give myself a little more room. It's not like I'm about to run out of space. Well, maybe it is, but that's okay. There's a thing called erasing. Uh, so three carbons, this is deglyceraldehyde. And biochemists use this D and L system. Ooh, did, did I forget to record? No, I didn't. Ooh, thank goodness. Uh, that would have been a pain to, to say all that again. <laughs> but biochemists use the D and L system. They don't use R and S. So uh, we're going to learn about that today. We're going to learn where the D and the L come from and how to tell whether a sugar is D or L. But this one is deglyceraldehyde. And another way to write the same thing, we also talked about Fischer projections. We said that this is a, a shorthand for the wedge and dot. Whoops, that should not be OH. That should be just H. We said that uh, these so-called Fisher projections are like a shorthand for these wedge and dot structures. And in order to make a Fisher projection, you just use straight lines. You don't have to worry about wedges and dots. And one important thing is in order to have a Fisher projection, you have to leave out the letter C. You have to make it like a line angle drawing. So just the intersection there is a carbon atom. You need to do that, otherwise it's not a proper Fisher projection. It's still a correct structure. It just doesn't convey any stereochemistry. So that's important. Be sure when you draw Fisher projections that you leave out the letter Cs at the intersections. That's really important. So those are both correct ways of drawing deglyceraldehyde. And uh, let me show you what L-glyceraldehyde looks like. I'll use a Fisher projection there as well. And you'll be able to see the difference. So this is L-glyceraldehyde. And you can see that what's changed 
is the direction of the OH group. And those two are in fact enantiomers. You remember the term enantiomer from our chapter on stereochemistry. So there's a fair bit of stereochemistry that's coming back in this chapter. And I'll also just a word of warning, I don't know if we'll get there today, but another thing that's going to come back is cyclohexane chains, because it turns out that using that type of structure is a really convenient way of drawing simple sugars, uh, special, well, most especially the hexoses, which are the ones with six carbon atoms. So like I said, I don't know if we'll get to that today, but we'll learn a few different ways of drawing these things. And that's gonna be the main thing I'm gonna focus on and I'm going to ask you guys to focus on is as always the structure. You know how obsessed we organic chemists are with structure by now. So be that as it may, these are both correct ways of drawing D-glyceraldehyde and this is L-glyceraldehyde using, uh, using um, a Fischer projection. But you could surely also draw this with this type of structure too. That's certainly not wrong, absolutely acceptable. So what determines whether it's D or L? And I'm gonna try to write some of this down since I have some space over here. Uh, so in order to determine whether it's D or L, the first thing you do is you go to the bottom of the molecule. By convention, we always draw the aldehyde or ketone functional group as near to the top as we possibly can. So in general, you'll find that the, uh, and I think we'll mostly be looking at aldoses, but if we do look at a few examples of ketoses, you'll see again, the ketone functional group is as close to the top as it can possibly get. By convention, that's how we draw simple sugars. So, the aldehyde carbonyl is going to be at the top of the molecule. That, by the way, is also carbon one. So if you were going to number the carbons, you would just number them one, two, three, like this, or one, two, three. So carbon one, which is going to be either the aldehyde carbonyl if it's an aldose, or at least as close to the ketone carbonyl as we can possibly get if it's a ketose, that by convention, we always put at the top of the structure. And so what you need to do in order to figure whether it's D or L is go to the bottom of the structure. And that carbon should always be CH2OH. Always, always, for real always, no exception. That carbon should always be CH2OH. And you, and you start there at the bottom carbon and you go up one carbon. This is the part that I'll write down. But you go up one carbon to the next to last carbon. They call it the penultimate carbon just to be, you know, because if we don't have a $60 word, someone's got their undies all in a bunch, right? We have to have as many $60 words as possible. So you look at the penultimate carbon and you look at the OH group on that carbon. And if the OH group on the penultimate carbon is on the right, it's a D sugar. If it's on the left, it's an L sugar. If OH on penultimate carbon, which is always going to be one up from the lowest CH2OH, because that, that last carbon should always be CH2OH, uh, is on the right. Looks like I wrote night. Let's try that again. It's a D sugar. If on the left, it's an L sugar. And as it turns out, by the way, D sugars are natural. Those are the ones that you will actually find in living systems. L sugars like L glyceraldehyde do exist. They're just not naturally occurring. They have to be made in the lab. So those are the opposite of the natural configuration. And by the way, I just have to give you a bit of bad news. Uh, this is gonna come up when we do our chapter on amino acids and polypeptides. For some reason, and I don't know what it is, for some reason, it's the D sugars that are natural and the L sugars that are unnatural. Unfortunately, the exact opposite is true for amino acids. It's the L amino acids that are natural and the D amino acids that are unnatural. And we'll get to that in our amino acids and polypeptides chapter. But it's just an annoying fact that we're gonna have to live with. Uh, I don't really know why that is, but we do use the D and L system for, uh, 
uh, biological molecules. You can count on this rule about the penultimate OH always working. It will never give you the wrong answer. You can, you can trust it. It will always give you the right answer. You simply look at the CH2OH that's on the bottom, and that should be a CH2OH on the bottom if everything's gone correctly. Uh, and you go up one carbon and you find the OH on that carbon and you look whether it's to the left or to the right. And if it's to the right, it's a D sugar, if to the left, an L sugar. So like I said, uh, D glyceraldehyde is the form glyceraldehyde actually takes in living systems. And glyceraldehyde is a very common metabolic intermediate. You'll find it in, um, Again, I'm no biochemist, but I'm nearly positive. You'll find it in glycolysis, for instance. Um, L-glyceraldehyde you will not find in living systems. Uh, it's, it's an unnatural compound. It does not occur naturally. It exists. One can buy it. Well, I don't know if we could buy it easily. If we were researchers in a chemistry lab, we probably could. But I can guarantee you it will cost many, many times, it will be many, many times more expensive than the D sugar, which is gonna be dirt cheap because they can get it from anything, just extract it. Good, so there's D glyceraldehyde and L glyceraldehyde. I might as well also show you the simplest ketose. Looks like this and that guy is called 1,3-dihydroxyacetone, which is a name that makes a lot of sense. I'll expect that acetone is a compound you'll have heard of. It's the simplest possible ketone. Acetone is just CH3, C double bond O, CH3. And if you put OH groups in carbons one and three of acetone, you get 1,3-dihydroxyacetone. So the name makes a lot of sense. That's the simplest possible ketose. And that also is a common metabolic intermediate. I believe you'll find that guy also in glycolysis uh, as we break glucose down from a six carbon compound to two three carbon compounds. I'm nearly positive, again, don't quote me on this, I am no biochemist, but I'm nearly positive, if I'm remembering correctly, that when you break the six carbon compound glucose down into two three carbon compounds, you in fact get D glyceraldehyde and 1,3-dihydroxyacetone. I mean, it might be 1,3-dihydroxyacetone phosphate, but it will, it will certainly be derivatives of those two molecules. Incidentally, if you'll also indulge me in a little bit of a side note, uh, dihydroxyacetone uh, bears a very close relationship to another molecule that we've seen before. And that molecule is glycerol. So if you reduce dihydroxyacetone, you get glycerol. And likewise, if you oxidize glycerol at that second carbon, you get dihydroxyacetone. And I don't think this would work well, I guess you could use a non-biological method to reduce dihydroxyacetone with, let's say, lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride that you've learned about that we've learned about recently. You would get glycerol very straightforwardly and in very high yield. I'm quite sure, but uh, you couldn't simply treat glycerol with PCC and get dihydroxyacetone because there's multiple OH groups. But there are enzymes that will do that for us. There are enzymes that will catalyze the reaction in both directions. So I just thought I'd point that out. I think this is probably part of the reason why glycerol is so benign, so non-toxic, because it's just one redox step away from 1,3-dihydroxyacetone, which our bodies most certainly know what to do with. So again, I never said I recommended drinking gallons and gallons of glycerol. That would not make a lot of sense, but in reasonable quantities, it's quite non-toxic. I guess anything becomes toxic in large enough quantities, but certainly in reasonable quantities, food grade glycerol is non-toxic. And, and I think that it, that has to be at least part of the reason why. Good, so I think that's all I need to say about the trioses, but, um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you're talking, uh, you're asking is this one, Eller? Ah, oh, I see what you mean, let me fix it. I thought you were asking if it was an L sugar. There we go, more better. And ha had you been asking uh, if glycerol or dihydroxyacetone or D or L, answer is neither. They're not chiral. So there's no issue of D and L over there. 
So why they use this whole separate DNL system, I don't really know, but it's been around for decades and decades, probably over a century. And so we're kind of stuck with it at this point. So um, that's probably all I really need to say about the triosis. Other questions about any of those? Well, accepting the most obvious one, in case I didn't make it clear, what do you have to know? I'm expecting you to memorize the structure of deglyceraldehyde. You can draw it either way. I don't care which way you draw it, but that's a really important compound. And, and when you know that structure, you automatically also learn how to tell D from L, because if you know deglyceraldehyde, you automatically also know L-glyceraldehyde. And so that will that will help you to remember. In fact, I think knowing how to tell if it's D or L automatically gives you D and L glyceraldehyde, almost. So certainly that one. The only other sugar structure I'm going to ask you to learn is that of glucose. And we'll, we'll get to that at such time. There are many others besides those. Uh, actually, we, we, might, we might hit on that point already a little bit right now, but certainly D glyceraldehyde, because if you learn that, you automatically know how to tell D from L. So I think that's actually worth your time. Uh, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of excessive amounts of rote memorization. I prefer, I greatly prefer understanding concepts and mastering them, but uh, a little bit is at least is unavoidable. And that's something I don't mind making you guys memorize because you'll get something for it. I think it's actually worth your time. Good, so where else does this D and L stuff show up? Let me just, make up some other, uh, let me make that a little bigger actually, I have the room. Let me make up a few more uh, sugar structures over here. Let's say we had, by the way, is it okay if I abbreviate an aldehyde functional group as CHO? That's an abbreviation you probably should know. I, I just don't feel like writing out like this every single time, but CHO is the standard abbreviation for aldehyde group. The reason we don't write COH is because then it looks like an alcohol. So that's why by convention we write CHO. So if we were to have a structure like this, well, if you ask me what that sugar is, I would say I have no idea and I don't expect you to know either, but I would expect you to know that it's a D sugar since the OH is on the right and, and that it is a tetrose because it has four carbons. One, two, three, four. That much I would expect you to know. Or to give another example along those lines, let's say we had this guy. Let's make a pentose. Once again, I have no idea what that compound is called and I wouldn't expect you to know it either, but I would expect you to know that it's an L sugar and that it's a pentose, it is five carbons. As to its actual name, I don't care if you know that. I don't expect you to memorize every single blasted one of these, there's so many. But glyceraldehyde's important and I think you'll agree glucose is pretty important. So those I don't mind. And uh, judging by our, the way the time is going today, I think we will at least be able to get through glucose today, at least through glucose in its straight chain form and understand something about that. And if we start getting more into the cyclic forms next time, that's fine. I th we have three whole class days to cover the basics in this chapter and I am in no mood to rush. Uh, good, oh, one other thing I was, uh, actually two other things I was going to say in terms of structure, recognizing that you're not being directly graded on your structure drawing in our exams. Uh, a couple things I'm going to discourage you from. You will often see biochemists omit the H. They just leave like a stick like that. I'm not a fan. Let's not do that. I think it's confusing because it looks like it's a methyl group then. So let's always write our agents. I just think it, it looks less confusing, it's clearer. The other thing you'll notice is when the OH group appears on the left side, you'll notice I'm being very careful to write HO, not writing OH. The reason is this makes it clear that it's the oxygen that's attached to the carbon. We're a little bit flexible with carbons. You've noticed we can write either CH3 or H3C for a methyl group, for instance. 
And we can afford to be flexible with carbons because it is for bonds. And if you're trying to write uh, carbon chain structures in a linear fashion using, using condensed structures, we have to be a little bit flexible because carbon is for bonds. But with oxygen, we can equally afford to be inflexible because oxygen is only two bonds. So we can always be clear about where the oxygen is attached. So that's the reason I'm doing that. And I would encourage you guys to do the same. Uh, I think you'll find uh, if you have to input any structures on OWL, it will also uh, have you put it that way. Yes. OK. You mean with these, these numbers, what I'm counting is the carbons. I'm numbering the carbons. Oh, no, th no, that also is counting the number of carbons. Tetros, pentos, trios, hexos, that's the number of carbons. So it won't necessarily be the same as the number of OHs. Yep. This one here, mm-hmm. I screwed that up, that's why. Thank you. Yes, that was a mistake. That should be CHO. Actually, those have names too. Those are called sugar alcohols, but I did mean for it to still be a sugar. Sugar alcohols, we'll talk about them later. They, they often show up as artificial sweeteners. So in your, you'll find them in like your chewing gum and things like that. But I did mean for that to be an aldehyde group. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, you're, you're, well, actually, it's true. How do you do that? I think they would know by which carbon had been the aldehyde group. I think that's how they would do it. But I certainly did mean for that to be an aldose. Yes, thanks for pointing that out. Yes. Tetra for four. That's OK. And this one, that one's a D sugar because the next to last OH is in the right, and this one's an L sugar because the next to last OH is on the left. Yep. Good, good questions. Other questions? I always feel so bad for the people that are directly behind me. Oh, wait, there is, uh, why is there a two? Okay, we caught that one. Isn't DNL arbitrary since you can flip molecules, you can look at them from the other side? Well, the reason it's not, it's not our visit question from chat. The reason it's not arbitrary is by convention, we always put the carbonyl group as close to the top as we possibly can. So that makes it no longer arbitrary. Uh, but that might also have been when I had two CH2OHs, which I did not intend to have. So once you put the carbonyl group and either the aldehyde or the ketone as close to the top of the molecule as you can, then it's always clear. Where the, where the ultimate and penultimate OH, flipping like a mirror. Well, but if you flip it like a mirror, it's a different molecule. You get the enantiomer. That's the thing, because these carbons are chiral. And if you mirror flip it, you'll get the enantiomer. Just like L-glyceraldehyde and D-glyceraldehyde are not the same thing. It's a good question though, but they're not the same thing. They're mirror images, they're enantiomers. And uh, any that, that actually brings up another good point. I would say any D sugar will have an L sugar as its enantiomer, and any L sugar will have a D sugar as its enantiomer. So uh, yeah, good question. So um, with that, I have about 15 minutes left. I still want to talk about glucose, at least in its straight chain forms. Um, uh, and we'll see how far we get into the cyclic forms. Uh, maybe we'll begin that. So um, what about glucose then? Like I said, if I had to pick one other molecule for you to memorize, it would be D-glucose. And let me give it to you. making sure I have my aldehyde group in place, that is D-glucose. So glucose is a hexose. There's six carbons in it. You would number again from the top at the aldehyde group is carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. And in this case, it's carbon five. That's the so-called penultimate or next to last carbon. That OH is on the right. So it's a D sugar. So that's the structure of D-glucose. I just remember right, left, right, right. You can probably come up with a much better mnemonic device than that, but that's the one I use. I just remember it's right, right, left, right, right. So um, 
couple other things about glucose. Um, just a reminder, actually, since we had a question about mirror flipping the compound, L-glucose, again, most certainly exists. But in order to get the L form, you need to mirror flip the whole thing. So all four of those carbons will flip configurations. So instead of right, left, right, right, it'll be left, right, left, left. And this is the enantiomer of D-glucose. And that guy would be L-glucose, which again, does exist, but it's not natural. It doesn't occur naturally in, uh, in living systems or in plants or anything like that. You would have to have it made special in the lab and it would probably be kind of expensive but I'm, I'm sure it exists. I know you can buy it. Uh, again, I would expect it to be hmm, dozens or even hundreds of times more expensive than glucose, maybe even more, because glucose you can get from anything, grapes, you know, everything has glucose in it. So um, uh, what else was I going to say about that? Uh, we're not really going to be so concerned too often with the L sugars. Uh, that would be one that I think you should maybe recognize. It, it happens to be the enantiomer of D-glucose, so it would be L-glucose. But I'm really mainly interested in you knowing the structure of D-glucose. Now, here's the thing. If <laughs> I'm reviewing so much material today, there's, there's so much coming back to haunt us from old chapters. But you might recall the two to the power N rule that we went over in chapter five on stereochemistry. We said that if there are N chiral carbons in a molecule, there's a maximum possible two to the power N of stereoisomers. And glucose has four chiral carbons in it. So that tells you that there's 16 possibilities of all the different stereoisomers of glucose. 16 possibilities, two to the fourth power. Of those 16 possibilities, eight of them will be D sugars because they'll have the OH on this side and eight of them will be L sugars because they'll have the OH on the other side. So what that means is D-glucose is one of eight different compounds that you could consider to be, and I'll write this down in a moment, you could call them the eight D-aldohexoses. There are eight D-aldohexoses. D we understand, Aldo meaning that they have an aldehyde functional group and hexose as we understand, means they have six carbon atoms. So there's eight of them of which glucose is one of them. There are seven others. They have names like talose and gulose and altrose. They have these other names. If this were a biochemistry class, you'd probably have to memorize all eight, not here. I don't expect you to memorize all of the other seven. I think glucose is enough because for my money, if you know glucose, you already in principle know the other seven. For example, if I told you that D-mannose is just like D-glucose, except it differs at carbon two, I think. Let me double check that. Eek, I didn't write it. Well, I did write it down. I just didn't label it. Uh, well, then you could figure out what it is pretty easily. Let me make that bigger. I'm sorry. This is, I'm being annoying here. Let me make that bigger. So CHO, and it would differ at carbon two. So instead, my OH will be on the left instead of on the right. Everything else will be the same. And that guy happens to be D manos, M A N N O S E. And I don't really care if you know that it's called that, nor do I care if you memorize manos. But you can see that it differs from D, -glu from D glucose. At carbon two. And if I told you that, that D manos differs from D glucose at carbon two, and you know what glucose is, then you can draw manos. That's, that's the only thing I'd need to tell you. So that's why I don't expect you to memorize all eight of them. I, I do, uh, that I don't think is a good use of your time. Because to my mind, if you know glucose, you automatically get the other seven thrown in for free. So I don't see any point in your memorizing all eight and I don't expect you to. Glucose, yes, that's an important molecule. 
Altros, Allos, Manos, no. Galactos, no. Gosh, I almost named them all. That's pretty scary. <laughs> I don't expect you to know the others, just glucose. And uh, beyond that, again, if you're looking at some hexose, I would expect you to be able to tell immediately if it's a D sugar or an L sugar. That we already know how to do. We look at the penultimate OH and we make the decision based on that. So, um, but yeah, I think D-glucose is the only important one for you guys to learn. I do not expect you to memorize the other seven. Uh, good. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I'm missing about glucose. Oh, maybe I'll just say this. If I were to give you this structure that happens to be mannose, once again, I would not expect you to know that it's mannose, but I would be expect you to be able to tell me this is a D sugar because it is the, the next to last OH on the right, and it is not glucose. That much I would expect you to be able to tell me, but I, I don't expect you to memorize the other set. Uh, good, I think that's really all I need to say about that. Any other questions for now then on glucose or these other simple sugars? Well, uh, in that case, I would like to switch to, let me get this right, make sure that the people in chat can see also. I would like to switch to your class notes for the next little bit. Um, uh, because there are other ways to draw glucose. In fact, glucose can do the very thing that we talked about on Monday. Uh, glucose and other simple sugars like that, as long as the chain is long enough, you need at least five carbons for it to happen. But if there, are, but these five or six carbon or even larger sugars can form hemiacetals, just like we talked about the other day. We gave as an example of something forming a cyclic acetal. We had something with an OH group and an aldehyde group, and we saw how you could get a five or six-membered ring that way. Glucose can do the exact same thing. In fact, there's two different ways it can do it. One of them I'm really less concerned that you know about, but you can get these two different cyclic forms that are called the furanose and pyranose forms. And uh, both of them exist. Uh, but what I, I, I have a couple of things going on in this diagram over here. So last thing for today, let me kind of walk you through this diagram. And we might have a little more to say about it next time. But um, here's D-glucose in its open chain form. Now, if you were to take some glucose and dissolve it in water, very little of it would remain in this open chain form at any given time. But it's in equilibrium with at least two other forms, really four, if you include the alpha and beta forms, but two other main forms, each of which has the so-called anomers, which we'll, I think we'll mostly talk about that the next time, but we might as well at least introduce the idea here. But uh, the reason we call these, these, these two forms the pyranoses is because they look a little bit like pyran, which is a heterocycle we didn't actually cover in the heterocycles chapter, but this is pyran. Pyran is not an aromatic heterocycle because it has, a, has this CH2 over here. So it has the, this sp3 hybridized carbon that ruins it in terms of aromaticity like benzene. But pyran is a thing that does exist. And you can see that these molecules have a six-membered ring with an oxygen in it, just like pyran does. So that's why we call these the pyranose forms. And uh, what I've done here is I've numbered the carbons and I've also shown you how it is that glucose forms this so-called pyranose form. It makes, and actually I noticed that in your textbook, there is another diagram equivalent to this that shows you the same information. They just do it in a different way. You might like the way it is in your textbook better. You might find that clearer, but I would suggest you take a look at both. So what I've done here is I've taken this glucose molecule, I've turned it on its side, and I've shown you which bond to rotate around. We're gonna rotate around the C4, C5 bond. I guess, what is that? Counterclockwise. And in so doing, the OH group that I put a box around comes over here. And then this OH group is going to do the very same thing we discussed in class on Monday. It's going to form a hemiacetal 
with this aldehyde functional group. And you'll see that you will get a six membered ring with five carbons and one oxygen in it. So that's how you get these so-called pyranose forms. And uh, there's actually two different hemiacetals that you can get. The hemiacetal is carbon one, which used to be the aldehyde carbonyl carbon. Now it's the so-called anomeric carbon or glycosidic carbon. There's a zillion words with carbohydrates, unfortunately. Fortunately. But, uh, but now that becomes the hemiacetal carbon. And there's two different hemiacetals depending on whether the OH group is pointing up or down. So, uh, so uh, and, and those two are also, those two also interchange by the way, because what happens is the hemiacetal can open back up to the open chain form and then form the other one. So these two are interconverting very rapidly at room temperature. It opens, it closes, it opens, it closes. And, and these two are interchanging very rapidly. So you have, these two pyranose forms in rapid equilibrium with the open chain form. And there are two others that result actually from the OH at carbon four making a hemiacetal and you get a five membered ring then. You get the so-called furanose forms because they look like furan. And by the way, I think we will probably start with this since I, uh, on cl in class next time, since I'm aware I'm pretty much out of time. But I at least wanted to show you these diagrams. We can review them next time. And uh, the other thing, I, I'm not going to ask you to learn the furanose forms, but they are also in rapid equilibrium with the open chain form and the pyranose forms. So you've got all of these in solution. Like I said, we'll start with this in class on Friday, I think. But uh, the only other thing I wanted to point out is that this type of drawing might look familiar to you. We had drawings looking a lot like that in the chapter on nucleic acids. And so these types of drawings are called Hayworth projections, H-A-W-O-R-T-H. -H. And they're one way of drawing sugars. They have their pluses and minuses. And we'll probably go over that next time. But I just wanted to point out that the straight chain form is in equilibrium with these other four forms. And I think that's enough for today. I think that's a good place to stop. We'll pick up there on Friday. So have a good day. We'll see you on Friday.